Shall we get started? I think it's, yeah, I will. I know that there, there will be more people joining, but we can just start. So welcome to our fifth uh, CM dialogue. And today we will be uh, talking about um, understanding and improving the governance of nature-based solutions. Today we have um, Liad Basse and Pam Makelui, who are uh, both leading the thematics, thematic groups of ecosystem governance and cultural practices of ecosystem management in, I, in, in the Commission on Ecosystem Management. So I will hand over to Liet, who will be starting with the first presentation. So can you see my presentation? Yeah. Perfect. And can you see it again? Okay. So, um, so thank you very much. And uh, so today I will be talking about uh, a component that is important for nature-based solution. Uh, which is uh, the inclusive, transparent, and empowering governance processes that need to be included uh, in the uh, when we look at the NBS. So, just to remind people, the the uh, nature-based solution are to uh, promote the resilience of both ecosystem and society. So, the social ecological system. And this is through conservation, restoration of biodiversity. And really what we talk here is um, really the net gain on biodiversity, ecological integrity and human well-being at the same time. Uh, and it helps improving the capacity of communities uh, on um, an ecosystem to adapt to changes and reduce uh, disaster risks. Now, when we look at the NBS, there are eight different criteria. And uh, the one that I will be talking about is the criterion number five, which is inclusive governance. And uh, if you look at here, you have uh, the five different indicators uh, that it looks at uh, the, uh, the, the importance of uh, resolution mechanisms, the participation and the mutual respects and equality uh, that uh, the stakeholder that are directly and indirectly affected by an NBS should be in, identified and involved. So there's question of engagement of uh, people and engagement also in the decision-making processes uh, and related with respects of rights and interests, uh, as well as understanding that uh, the NBS may go beyond the jurisdictional boundaries that uh, we have. So the main challenges I have heard that in implementing this criterion, and this is where the research is needed, and this is something that we discussed a bit before, is that uh, we have to be careful about how it's done in terms of uh, external organization coming and thinking that they know better than the community. Uh, Short-term projects, Often it's not possible, especially when we look at restoration. Uh, governments sometimes want to have results very fast. Political turnaround is usually four years in most countries. So that means it needs to be uh, with the results very quickly. There's a lack of understanding and often a lack of respect for indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, ecological knowledge for, from people. And often we focus only on one very specific location and forget about the larger landscape and the possible of having other impact on other location. So that we still have a lot of uh, work to be done. And uh, just a scope is uh, April 23rd, we'll be presenting on uh, the first draft of the principle of eco ecosystem governance. And hopefully that uh, can help, but th th there's a really a need to make sure that there are tools that are available for communities that are working in uh, this field. 
Uh, as uh, Angela mentioned, uh, we have uh, the uh, thematic uh, uh, group on uh, ecosystem governance. And in this case, what we're looking at is inclusive ad approach to better connect uh, the, uh, the uh, social system and the ecological system to improve conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem health for human well being. So it's directly related to nature based solution. Because if you have your population uh, or the, the group around that uh, can help and uh, understand why it's needed to do certain things, find solution, that means that they will probably most likely keep it in the long term. So we're talking about sustainability. So when we look at the nature-based solution and governance, we always start with the societal challenges but what we want by the end is this net, net gain. And the net gain can be uh, depending on the social challenges, challenge that uh, we're looking at. But the net gain means that it's not only for human well being, but also for the biodiversity and ecological integrity. And when we look at that, uh, ecosystem governance also relates to sustainable development uh, because we're looking at a way to look in the long term, not just the short term. And this is also the, what I would say is uh, an important factor of uh, nature-based solution. There are two concepts that we have to always remember. There's a concept of needs, but also the concept of limitation. Limitation in terms of technology, social organization, and the environment uh, ability to uh, continue to uh, function. And this is where we often have uh, big issues. So why governance is important for nature-based solution? But first of all, um, we have to remember the, that uh, the OECD uh, analysis look at the 169 SDGs target and discovered that 105 of them can only be reached if you have local or regional governments and that uh, they can be promoted at multi-level governance level. The partnership is important. And uh, it means also even including the private sector. But we have to make sure that people, the civil society are engaged in policymaking or decision-making processes. And that has to be done with the integration of the ecological system. So what are the prerequisites for ecosystem governance? But in some way we need to make sure that national laws and policies are there to enable uh, local governments for self rule. Uh, and that means a decentralization or a devolution that is possible. And these local governments uh, must align with these uh, national policies, but it has to be done by being efficient in terms of public participation. And it's really more effective when we look at it at the local level. Other prerequisite, but we need scientific knowledge and education. And that means that uh, it will help through social learning the, 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 um, the process of decision-making because most of these nature-based solution uh, action that we'll be doing uh, will be interdisciplinary. So it's not only just looking at the natural science, but it's looking also at the social science, especially when we talk about societal challenges. But it's also looking at uh, health issues, looking at uh, social acceptability, etc. So it's very important to look at the, the, these different components. It includes also traditional knowledge, local knowledge, or ecological knowledge, depending on which community we're working with. Um, it's needed for proper identification of the social ecological system. It's not only to have a baseline on the ecological system because we, we want to restore something. It's really more a question of, of knowing also the needs and the, um, what people are thinking about it. Uh, it has to go really beyond economic approach, and that's uh, certainly important. And it's important to enhance uh, public engagement. Uh, 
So it's essential by the end to include all stakeholders. And that means the different genders, the different uh, groups, underrepresented groups as well, uh, that often are left alone, alone and are not part of this, the, these uh, discussions. So key points to acknowledge when uh, we look at ecosystem governance. First of all, is that it's complex and that the process is not necessarily linear. That means that we may have a path and suddenly it change a bit to get back to another path, depending on who are part of the discussion. Um, it will have a certain footprint and accountability to consider, uh, and that has to, uh, to, to, to bring the, uh, the importance of uh, resources and giving the, the possibility for people to really be engaged. Uh, the scalability is possible with flexibility and adaptability, because what is happening in terms of ecosystem governance in one place may not be exactly the same thing in another place, depending on uh, the, uh, the framework, depending on the, the, the population, depending on many other factors. Engagement is necessary and we need trust building. There's a question of time and space. Uh, and we already mentioned that we have to always be careful that what we do in one landscape may probably impact the other landscape. Important also to have a transparency, a transparency in terms of data, information, but also decision. And that this is why it's so important to have all the stakeholders around the table. And that means that there may be a uh, transformation. And finally, inclusivity, as I said, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, different uh, ages, race, culture, sexes are all included in the discussion. Other principles that are important uh, is that uh, we know that it will be context dependent. It, and this is where the top down meets the bottom up. So we have to have really individuals, but also as I said, the local uh, authorities that are part of this. Implication, for, as you can imagine, in terms of policy development and capacity building, the need to respect cultural practices and livelihood, and finally, an appreciation for the importance of ecosystem services. So action are needed, that's for sure. The capacity building at all level, and this is where social learning is so important. Uh, and it means that uh, we have to also recognize the roles that the local communities play in this. And I should say, having worked with several coastal communities, for example, it takes time. It's not something that is possible to do, uh, you know, on a, as a project of a year, for example. This is something that takes time because just even developing the trust of everybody can be quite demanding. So uh, it's important that it's known that it will be uh, something that is for the long term, not just the short term. Just wanted to give a couple of examples that uh, are uh, happening in real life. Uh, this is Comanda in Ecuador. Uh, and uh, this is a place that uh, I should say it was so amazing to be there uh, because uh, this is a, um, uh, a farmer that uh, had quite a large landscape and has decided to, instead of doing what all the others were doing around him, having a plantation of only neem or laurel or oranges, he decided to have a higher biodiversity by replanting some of the native species, leaving the herbaceous, and you can see how dense it can be, uh, leaving the, uh, the the, the, the ground vegetation capable of growing again, uh, which is completely different. If you look at most of these other plantations around, they were completely bare of no vegetation on the ground. But what is important is that it also over time brought other type of biodiversity, that is birds, uh, but also because he's using only the wood that he needs when he has an order, for example, for a door or for a frame for, for a window, it will go and cut only that tree, not more, get it out. Three weeks later, 
because he has a nursery, he will be uh, taking one of these trees, this young tree, and will be replanting it. So he's making sure that there's always revegetation uh, that it's happening. And uh, it does that for many, many species of trees. It's not just one species. Uh, it really wants to have a lot more. But what he has among all these, um, these different trees is, for example, cacao. So not only is he using this for us for when he needs for planks and all that, but because of uh, the possibility to have cacao, he has also pineapple, some orange trees, etc. He can also harvest that and send to the market. So what is important here is that instead of having him alone for this plantation, he is in fact hiring five different families. So instead of having him only and having to wait until the plantation is ready to cut and that's it, he has on an annual basis, five families working with him, therefore reducing poverty and unemployment of people at the same time then enhancing biodiversity. The other example that uh, I would like to, uh, to talk about is Wapishka. Wapishka is uh, uh, in uh, Quebec, in uh, Northern Quebec. It's uh, close to Bécomo. And um, what is interesting to know in this case is that uh, this is a, um, a, uh, a community, and like, the community is called Pesemit, uh, that um, started to work with the uh, biosphere reserve in this case. And uh, they were, uh, I would say, um, encouraged in some way, uh, inspired by a uh, report that came out called Together We Rise. And this is uh, looking at target 11 in Canada, which is the RT target one uh, in, uh, when we talk about the RT target. Um, and they, they decided at the Biosphere Reserve that the Wapishka station, instead of being uh, managed by anybody, it would be an agreement with the Pesemit community. And one thing that, this, that they wanted to do is two things, increase employment for the community, but also reduce the dropout of high school students, especially young men tend to drop out from school in the indigenous communities, and they wanted to help at this level. So uh, you can see uh, Jean-Philippe uh, on one side who is the director of the, the biosphere. And uh, this is one of the young indigenous guardians. So they have now several young indigenous guardians that are managing uh, the, uh, the Wapishka station. They are also guide for people coming to do either research or for tourism. And um, at the same time, they can teach, if you want, the, um, the uh, traditional knowledge and different components. So this is a way to not only protect biodiversity because the Wapishka station is part of a conservation area, but also it helps the community to reduce poverty and the dropouts of young in the community, which usually when they drop out, they usually make a lot of unfortunately damage in other places. And this is something that uh, they were trying to avoid. I'll just leave with uh, this uh, that uh, was uh, said by Alice Hughes at uh, the World Conservation Con Congress in 2016, when we had our first session on ecosystem governance, which is that ecosystem governance and nature-based solution are not optional, but essential to ensuring continued access to vital ecosystem services and to human well-being. So thank you very much. And uh, I guess I will uh, stop sharing and give the, to uh, Pam. Great, thank you so much, Leah. Yes, I will continue on from here and I think we will save questions um, for the end of the webinar. So let me share my screen. Great, can everyone see that? Yeah. Good, 
Great. Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, additional criteria um, regarding trade-offs that's in, for example, the global standard on NBS. And we know that trade-offs are an important part of thinking about governance, and so they really deserve their own attention here. So within the global standards um, for NBS, uh, there is an explicit criterion, criterion six, which says that nature-based solutions should equitably balance trade-offs between the achievement of their primary goals and the continued provision of multiple benefits. And there are sub criteria under this sort of explaining a little bit more what that means. Um, and importantly, the sub criteria point out that nature based solutions, although we know they pr do provide positive benefits, there may be costs. And so those costs and benefits uh, may be in the form of trade offs. And so we need to acknowledge those and potentially use that understanding of trade offs to inform safeguards or corrective actions if needed. We also need to acknowledge that rights and use and access to land and resources is unevenly distributed even prior to an NBS, um, and the NBS itself may also affect um, people's access and use to land and resources. So we need to understand and acknowledge and respect those potential differences. Um, and we need to have a formal way to understand and acknowledge all of these roles of stakeholders and even rights and so forth. Um, and so the NBS standard recommends that there is use of established safeguards, which are periodically reviewed to ensure that trade-off limits are respected, that not all of the trade-offs are placed as a burden on one particular community, um, and particularly acknowledging that um, unfair, unequal, unjust trade-offs may actually destabilize the entire NBS. So we need to be careful about that. Um, so what does that mean in practice? That's what I want to um, spend my time uh, talking about today. So I think the, the important thing is to think about how the fact that trade-offs will occur. Um, and this is important because I think too often there is a sense that um, NBS are just wonderfully positive win-win-wins. And we hope that's the case, but we have to acknowledge that that may not always be the case and that every NBS intervention is likely to incur some type of trade-offs, no matter how well designed it is. And these trade-offs may be very different. They may be trade-offs within um, ecosystem services. They may be trade-offs around governance. So great examples are the fact that some coastal um, NBS measures may, for example, reduce public access to beaches and shorelines. Um, this has been very controversial here in my home state of New Jersey, where dune replenishment uh, and sand dune uh, replanting and restoration with native um, seagrasses and other uh, types of vegetation has restricted some public access. And so that has been considered to be somewhat controversial. We can also imagine reforestation programs that might introduce competition with food production. So we have a trade off between different types of benefits. Um, we also have the potentially concerning situation where NBS are increasingly used as offsets um, in return, for example, for fossil fuel companies to continuing uh, to create carbon emissions or do biodiversity damaging activities elsewhere. So we really have a trade off between um, the sites of action and the overall impact of action. Um, and so we need to acknowledge these trade-offs. And our experience to date shows that the costs of inaction are not evenly shared for many interventions. Um, but despite this, several recent assessments that have looked across NBS case studies um, have revealed that not enough attention is being paid to this question of trade-offs. So this uh, 2016 article, which reviewed more than 100 urban NBS projects, 
um, that are that were published in the academic literature revealed that only 16% of those published case studies acknowledged any potential trade offs or negative consequences. Um, and the distribution of those trade offs, the question of equity was barely mentioned at all. So we have a real gap here that we need to pay attention to. Um, there are real concerns about not acknowledging trade offs. It risks greenwashing just having the label of NBS. Um, but you know, might destabilize the NBS. Um, we might see protests against NBS actions, even some displacement of people from land if, if these trade-offs are not managed appropriately. So we need to be very cautious. Um, indigenous people in particular have expressed concern about the challenges in engaging with NBS and the need for equity and respect and acknowledgement of traditional and indigenous knowledge systems in the process of NBS design and implementation. So we really need, these are all justifications for trade-off arrangements to be fully understood, widely shared across affected stakeholders and periodically revisited. Um, just doing it once is not going to be effective. So in terms of thinking about trade-offs, we can think about trade-offs in different areas. We have potentially biophysical trade-offs. These are trade-offs among ecosystem services that our NBS might deliver. So we can imagine trade-offs between say carbon sequestration and water flow um, that might occur in an NBS that used fast growing but non-native species. We can imagine trade-offs between biodiversity protection and some of the societal challenges that are trying to be addressed. We have governance trade-offs among stakeholders. Uh, we have trade-offs among those with power and those without power. Trade-offs around different knowledge systems, more scientific approaches versus those that are based on indigenous and local knowledge. We can also imagine trade-offs among decision to support tools, which are increasingly common in designing NBS. Um, so between say cost benefit analysis and other forms of valuation. There's also, we know scale and temporal trade-offs potentially in NBS. So the trade-offs between tackling a very local problem and those larger drivers that create societal challenges in the first place. There's also potential trade-offs that, that are going to be generated outside of a project area. Um, there's also short-term versus long-term um, challenges within NBS, how we can balance, say, a short-term employment that might occur in a, in a, a restoration program, but long-term employment might be much more constricted. We also have trade-offs around benefits. You know, How are benefits from the NBS going to be um, translated, they might be uneven. People in higher income classes might benefit more. Um, there might be uneven gender benefits. Um, the costs of an NBS um, might be borne by those that aren't benefiting, such as say green gentrification around um, urban green spaces might lead to displacement of low income residents. Um, and there can also be a lack of acknowledgement of non-monetary and cultural benefits um, from NBS that we need to be aware of. So what does the literature on NBS trade-offs tell us um, about some of these problems? What does it tell us about where attention is happening in the, the governance approaches to NBS? So I looked at a couple of uh, meta-analysis about governance issues within NBS. Um, one, this Brink 2016 article is primarily about your, uh, your urban NBS solutions. Uh, the McVitie article in 2018 is specifically about European um, NBS projects, um, not restricted to urban. And what did they find? They found, for example, in urban um, uh, ecosystem-based adaptation cases specifically, that success factors primarily related to whether or not there was existing capacity, whether or not there were supportive legal frameworks, and whether or not there was support from citizens in the form of pre-existing local participation, whether in flood reduction, grassroots movements, protests, and so forth. The barriers to successful NBS included a lack of resources, 
unsupportive legal frameworks, um, compartmentalization where um, NBS was sort of shunted off into just environmental departments, but not integrated across other ones. Um, concerns about not in my backyard, people not wanting the NBS to, to, to impact um, them specifically, um, and some ecological trade-offs as well. Um, in the European projects, the success factors were considered to be around stakeholder engagement and attitudes, whether or not there was cooperation across stakeholders, um, alignment of activities across different government, local government agencies that were included, um, the use of existing knowledge or ongoing research, so integrating um, science uh, knowledge and, and local knowledge into practice and monitoring. Um, clear demonstration of private benefits, so not just public benefits, but some potential private benefits and co-benefits from the NBS action, and then available uh, availability of multiple sources of finance. Um, problem med measures, particularly related to lack of finance, um, poor stakeholder engagement and negative attitudes, particularly around trade-offs, um, lack of cooperation and consent across multiple landowners, um, lack of land, again, a trade-off, there's, you know, having to buy land for implementation might create trade-offs, and then these time lags, these trade-offs around time lags. So how do we overcome some of these demonstrated governance trade-offs? What can we do? Well, the first thing we can think about is the fact that a lot of these NBS trade-offs revolve around disagreements due to conflicting values and priorities. So these can be explicitly acknowledged. Um, and one way we can think about doing a better job of acknowledging them is to build in the experience that people have with place-based systems and their contextual knowledge. Um, and they can help inform these trade-offs. So for example, in one study about green infrastructure um, and flood risk, making a concerted effort to understand people's existing knowledge about flood risk. What did they know? How did they experience flood risk in the past? Um, and understanding how that risk knowledge shaped their attitudes and their motivations to adopt new solutions would help enhance design and reduce the barriers to green infrastructure. So it's really about meeting people where they are. And as Liette said, this takes potentially a long time, um, but it's more than just a one-off meeting. And it's more than just explaining what an NBS is. It's really backing up and understanding people's um, knowledge around risk, around their experience of place and building that into the NBS from the start. Um, and one sector that can particularly help is cultural ecosystem services. They can really resonate especially strongly within NBS plans. Uh, an example would be um, the way in which um, senses of identity and pride could be built into restoration programs so that the restoration isn't just about ecological components, but it's about which ecological components resonate with people's sense of place and their cultural practices. That can build in support for NBS and help manage those trade-offs. Um, it's really about using knowledge to establish trust, to communicate inclusively, and as Liette really emphasized, promote that social learning. So um, I've put up a case study here of, of a place where that was done really well in the two year um, salmon restoration um, uh, programs that the, the, those tribes have been doing in the Pacific Northwest in the US. Um, so um, salmon runs have been particularly important for cultural practices and economies. And the two Tulalip tribes um, initiated a sustainable land strategy to build resilience, um, particularly at the basin scale, to generate gains in the health of fish and farm communities, as well um, as to improve flood control, uh, tribal culture, indigenous knowledge, and so forth. So the NBS was really built with multiple objectives. Um, one of the things that the tribes were able to do was to build riparian buffers to make basically living fences 
um, along some of the uh, corridors that were part of the salmon runs. So the tree served as a defensive barrier against flood damage to nearby farms. So it, it was able to receive buy-in from farmers, um, but it also protected river habitat um, that the tribes were really interested in protecting um, for salmon runs. So it was a way to try to get co-benefits across multiple stakeholders. Um, and then the tribes also worked very closely with the university to design an integrated model, this MIMES model that some of you may be familiar with um, to balance ecosystem services benefits. Um, and there were extensive meetings across local experts and traditional knowledge holders um, to inform those modeling efforts um, and to talk about trade-offs and use it to create a narrative document. So the model wasn't just a model, but it was a, a narrative. Um, an explanation of what the importance of place was to the to you. Um, and it really was able to set the framework for thinking about future scenarios about decisions on management. So it was really a co-production process. Um, and so overall, those the acknowledgement of those benefits have been in, important in that particular case study. Um, so thinking about ensuring equitable cost and benefits within any NBS is really going to be essential for long-term support. Um, a lot of recent studies have emphasized that NBS benefits uh, are wider than traditional infrastructural approaches. So for example, one recent study of ecological infrastructure projects uh, revealed that 85% reported positive natural capital indicators 72% on positive income and 51 on positive employment. So those are all good indicators, but the problem is that those benefits often aren't discussed in terms of their equitable sharing. So how were, how were those benefits shared among different groups? Um, and so focusing on those equitable benefit sharing will be really important. Um, we know, for example, that higher levels of knowledge and acceptance of NBS often correlate with higher income and education. So there's a real danger that just focusing on people who know already about NBS and are um, positively inclined towards NBS, um, we have to reach out. We have to reach out to folks who don't know about um, what NBS are and what the benefits could be. Um, we also need to be explicit that there may be some costs. Um, this can include displacement, uh, in cases where land has to be acquired or land is rezoned. Um, and so acknowledging those costs is gonna require fair and transparent negotiation if there's land uh, at, at, at risk um, and compensation for losses um, being built into NBS projects. Um, and we have to be careful about the tools that are used for this because if we just focus on cost benefit analysis alone, it could miss some of the non-market values and cultural priorities that are so essential for uh, ensuring long-term NBS support. Um, another example is that there's, NBS often use willingness to pay studies or people willingness to, uh, what's their willingness to, to, to you know, visit a tourist site or to um, you know, have a green or park near their area. Um, those sorts of studies don't acknowledge who actually bears the cost. Um, you know, a park might create benefits for some, but raise rental prices for other in, in a process of green gentrification. So often our tools um, don't do a sufficient job of thinking about the equitable um, costs and benefits. So encouraging there to be a discussion, uh, frank discussions about what are the co-benefits, what are the potential costs, um, is one way to really think about wider sharing of different types of benefits. Um, and to give a case study of a place that, that did this well, um, this is a case study that comes from Deborah Roberts, who um, is working group two um, uh, co-chair for the IPCC and who's been a longtime uh, urban municipal official in Durban, South Africa. Um, and in the process of putting together a municipal climate protection program in Durban, um, they really wanted to incorporate ecosystem-based adaptation um, and specific urban NBS interventions. Um, and what they really did was a learning by doing approach that was incremental, it was iterative, there was a lot of focus on experimentation and flexibility. Um, they really encouraged um, NBA activities that were tied to place and culture um, by telling stories about them. 
Um, and that try that that attempt really helped in thinking about what co-benefits might be there um, and having explicit trade-offs built into some of their specific interventions. Um, so one of the stories that they were able to talk about um, in those municipal EBA interventions was talking about um, how local livelihoods um, could really be told to stories um, about, you know, how important yearly sardines were, were the, the sort of yearly sardine run that local economies um, supported, really helped with tourism, um, and a whole narrative was really built about the importance of the NBA. It wasn't really just seen as a, as a one-off intervention. So how, how can we do this? What are the, the nuts and bolts of doing that? So um, Liette really emphasized stakeholder involvement is so crucial to thinking about managing trade-offs. Um, and that raises the question of, you know, who are these key stakeholders and actors? Um, and again, in reviews of uh, overall NBS case studies, um, all too often, key actors are never actually named. The NBS uh, sort of treats stakeholders as a homogenous group, and they aren't really discussed in terms of their particularities. Um, so local government is often the, the key stakeholder in, in, in many studies, um, and citizens, business, and other governments play a much smaller role. Um, and in a lot of case studies, there's no identification of stakeholders at all, as I said. So really thinking critically about who are stakeholders, what are they doing, what might their their uneven roles be can really help in thinking about the different facets of justice. You know, um, how are people going to benefit from the distribution of benefits? Um, were they involved in procedural justice? Were they invited? Um, and were they recognized for their cultural practices as part of the NBS process? And the evidence is pretty strong that NBS that have a high level of participant involvement tend to report more positive outcomes across more socioeconomic dimensions. So how do we do this? We think about it in terms of stakeholder analysis or mapping um, and the ways to um, engage the different stakeholders. Again, trust is so, so crucial and that can't be built in, in a short, just one-off meeting. Um, that it really needs to be, again, about inclusivity and social learning over time. And so that's why the case study in Durban put so much focus on iterative learning by doing. Um, there's, of course, always dangers in extensive stakeholder processes. You can always run into stakeholder fatigue, um, people not wanting to be involved, um, just sort of pushing the project away. They don't want it in their backyard. Um, and so we need to understand how transparent, transparent decision making can, can really help distribute those costs and benefits um, and ensure public uh, uh, say so, particularly in NBS that are run by, by private uh, actors and companies. Um, and as Liat emphasized, it really achieve a balance between scientific expertise and ILK, bottom-up procedures um, with involvement of appropriate uh, government stakeholders as well. So this is a graphic from a recent report that did such a stakeholder mapping. You know, here's an example of what it would look like to understand the different stakeholders and be able to engage them in different ways. Um, stakeholders in this case um, fit sort of general categories. You can see in the legend, you know, official authorities, political representatives, civil society, private sector, academia, media, um, and other international organizations, you know, pretty standard categories. But what was interesting is um, when they actually did a stakeholder analysis, they talked to people about, you know, what were their uh, sense of uh, understanding of the NBS? What did they want to see out of the NBS? And they were able to put these stakeholders across different quadrants um, and organize them by groups. And they really found a small number of stakeholders were really in charge. And not surprisingly, that was dominated by uh, local authorities. But there was another group that they considered to be um, basically the most engaged, to have the most knowledge, and to really be able to, to shape what the NBS looked like. Um, and that was a group that was fairly mixed, but it involved a lot of civil society folks um, and folks from the private sector as well. Then you had some stakeholders that were fairly quiet, but appreciated being there. Um, folks that were 
moderately concerned, but tended to be mostly officials and then folks that were observers. Um, and so thinking about these sort of groups of stakeholders, um, uh, able, it, you know, it sort of enables folks to think more critically about how the NBS is actually going to be um, shaped, um, who needs to be revisited over time, you know, which groups are most active, can you go back to them and pull in those groups that were un not as active? These are all things to be thinking about in, in stakeholder mapping um, exercises. Um, here's an example of a case study where stakeholder engagement um, didn't happen uh, as successfully. And, and what were the reasons for that? Um, this was a case study of um, EcoDRR in Rio de Janeiro, where there were large numbers of landslides um, in uh, poor informal areas in the favelas on the outskirts. And the local authorities really wanted to improve um, and protect these landslide areas with tree planting, um, but there was insufficient stakeholder involvement. So the high level of informality really excluded some of the important actors. Um, they weren't involved in decision-making. It hindered the authorities um, from being actively involved in areas that were most at risk. So trees were planted by external actors, folks that had been hired to plant trees, um, but security issues in the favelas sort of prevented any sort of extensive stakeholder process. Um, and because benefits aren't gonna be seen for a while, um, the project beneficiaries were skeptical. They hadn't been consulted. They didn't see the point of this. Um, and this was a fairly unsuccessful project. So we wanna potentially avoid those sorts of uh, problems if we can. So we're, we're getting close to, to running out of time. So I'm gonna just quickly wrap up and say a couple other things that we need to think about um, in terms of improving um, uh, uh, trade-off management, uh, particularly around stakeholders. Um, and one thing we need to think about is the fact that a lot of NBS projects use de decision support tools. Um, these can be ecosystem mapping, ecosystem modeling, and so forth. Um, but not all of these decision support tools do a good job of addressing trade-offs or the uneven and inequitable distribution of benefits. So be wary of overuse of tools that don't include a component um, that's able to address um, the, the unevenness of, of benefits and the potential for trade-offs. So we can't let the tools um, overshadow what we want to get out of them potentially. So the last thing I want to talk about are safeguards. These are so important um, for NBS. They really need to be in place. Um, particularly since inequity may change over time and we need to sort of constantly revisit these stakeholders. Um, so that calls for long-term assessment to make sure that safeguards um, are being met over time. Um, and how do we actually do this? Well, for depending on the NBS, depending on the size and the scale, different approaches might be uh, more or less appropriate. Um, for sure, free prior and informed consent um, is always gonna be necessary, uh, particularly in work with indigenous communities, but that often is treated as a one-off thing. So we really need continuous um, safeguards processes. There are a lot of formal ones that are already out there that can be used. Um, so for example, the climate community and biodiversity safeguards, um, uh, new ones can be designed based on these existing safeguards. Um, examples of uh, things that could be built into the, the NBS include things like grievance mechanisms. Is it clear who you can com complain to about an NBS? Um, consultation obligations, um, rights of appeal, um, specific legal contracts that could address trade-offs within the contract itself, um, and other forms of legal and regulatory provisions. So these really are important. If you remember earlier in my presentation, I talked about how those legal frameworks were really keys to success. So building safeguards and trade-offs into those legal frameworks um, can be really important. And I'll leave you with one final case study um, where this didn't happen um, and it resulted in inequitable benefits. Um, and that's a case study from Gujarat, India, where urban ponds um, were upgraded and restored um, for ecosystem services benefits about water retention, um, water storage, groundwater recharge, and sewage treatment. Um, and the, in this particular city from the, the case study, Navsari City, um, the efforts by urban authorities to restore these water bodies 
um, particularly focused on drinking water and nature conservation and aesthetics and recreation, which were not what lower classes living around these ponds had primarily valued. They were much more interested in having access to water for sanitation, um, for fishing and so forth. Um, and the local authorities didn't have safeguards. They didn't have consultation processes. Um, and what they decided to do was to actually fence in these urban ponds during the process of restoration. When trees were planted, fences also went up. Um, local informal areas and slums were actually displaced as part of the restoration efforts. Um, hundreds of families were moved uh, out of the edges of these ponds. Um, lower classes that had used the ponds um, for washing jobs lost their jobs. Fishers lost access to fish. The households that were resettled um, didn't receive full compensation. So it was really a bit of a disaster in terms of not meeting um, what we'd like to see for safeguards and trade-offs um, being addressed explicitly. So these are the sorts of situations we want to avoid in NBS projects to try to ensure that equity uh, and equitable distribution of benefits. Um, so thanks very much. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, and I think we want to open it up to, to questions at this point. So should we address some of the questions that have come in on the um, written Q&A? Uh, maybe some of the people that uh, have, have asked these questions might want to jump in and, and, and phrase them uh, so that everyone can hear them. Does anyone want to go first for questions, maybe, or should I just read them? Maybe I'll start with reading while we um, are thinking about people who might want to ask some questions live. So I'll start with um, Madhav's uh, question about stakeholder consultations. Um, they're crucial, but not all stakeholders are equal. Not all stakes are equal for all stakeholders, and there's no level playing field. Um, how do we include everyone for everyone's sake and make the platform equal for all stakeholders? Great question. Um, Liette, do you want to? think about yeah. this and I can ch chime in as well? Yeah, yeah. I, this is always a big challenge. This is why it's so important uh, of uh, the issue of uh, and having everybody at the table and being transparent uh, and making sure that there's no agenda behind that people are coming with uh, their real agenda where why they want to be there. Uh, and I should say that uh, this is a phase, I always say that the first phase of uh, trying to start a project like that and having um, everybody around the table is crucial. It needs to be done very carefully. It's a question of, uh, of uh, making sure that uh, it's, uh, it, that anybody helping in putting that together have good credential, they keep their integrity, but also making what I call an ethical space for everybody to be able to participate and give what they need. And that's a very, very important. Uh, and I, I usually I remember in my first project, we took two meetings to make sure that everybody was trusting everybody that everybody understood the problem that we were looking at before even starting to think about solution. And that's very important because if they don't, usually uh, there may be um, animosities, conflicts and everything coming up. So it's better to be frank from the beginning than trying to, uh, to do differently and uh, trying to speed up this process. It's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully agree with all of those. Um, and and the, this, this idea that stakeholder engagement is not something you do just um, when you have the NBS already designed, right? That it has, to, it has to be much earlier than that and it has to be a process as opposed to a one-off thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. great. 
Good. Um, so Mike uh, Jones has asked a question. We know what needs to be done to establish good govern governance for effective NBS design and implementation. The problem is that we lived in a world dominated by economists who only think in terms of financial uh, efficiency. Um, how can we create change in the funding of NBS so that gen uh, genuine local participation and empowerment can be achieved? Uh, yeah, fantastic question, Mike. Um, I would say one of the things um, that uh, we need to sort of distinguish between are the different um, types of NBS, because we know, of course, that there's going to be um, the private sector is going to start uh, funding more and more of these, particularly now that we have the global standard, we see the interest by a lot of private companies um, in thinking about NBS, either in a formal offset program or corporate social responsibility and so forth. Um, some, some much more integrated, you know, seeing the um, risks of not using nature in their, say, supply chains. And so they might be interested in, in, in NBS to sort of guarantee um, future activity. So there's going to be different motivations. Um, and so for private NBS, um, I think we're, you know, IUCN as a community is going to be in, in uh, a great position to help with those. I can see those being funded um, fairly well because they're being funded by private entities, um, but there might be attempts to take shortcuts on the stakeholder consultations and so forth. And so that's where I see um, us and IUCN at the global standard and all of the, the good case studies and good practice we can bring in um, and point out that even for the well-funded, um, privately funded NBS projects, um, there's long-term risks from, from doing those corner cutting um, and that those NBS are much more likely to be sustainable over time by going through these uh, processes of stakeholder engagement and transparency and so forth. Um, and so example for a private MBS might be having a um, advisory board, which is made up of public citizens, um, mm -hmm. making sure that your data from your private MBS is transparent and accessible. Um, so you're like monitoring data uh, for a private company that's monitoring its MBS, that should be open and accessible as well. So for the, the private ones, um, I feel like there's things that they can do. The funding may not be the problem, but that that participation and empowerment needs to be um, explicitly embedded uh, much better. Um, Leah, do you want to jump in on this as well? Yeah, but I'm thinking about also uh, when governments are funding some of them and that, that will, I, and this is where we have to be careful because uh, in Canada, for example, they mixing up uh, nature-based solution with nature climate solution. And what's happening is they mixing them up. They think that they are doing a good job, but uh, they are doing it only in terms of uh, planting trees, for example. And uh, so they don't necessarily address the societal challenge and they usually don't uh, have uh, a good idea of what's happening. And, uh, and that's something that uh, I'm really concerned because it's really more a political game than really uh, taking care of the community, trying to put the stakeholders together or anything like that. So we have to be careful because governments... Oh, sorry. sorry, we're on lockdown, so... Uh, <laughs> We, uh, what I've seen is that in many cases, they are um, trying to push too fast and they don't have a good understanding. The other concern that I have is uh, a bit like what happened with the RED uh, program in many places is that they put trees that are exotic, uh, that are in fact impacting and, and uh, they're, and I've experienced that in Burkina Faso, in Ecuador, where eucalyptus were planted and now the small rural community that doesn't have a lot of capacity is stuck with these eucalyptus that are taking all the water or infringing in their agricultural patches and in fact destroying their life. So we have to, to be very careful about these things too. 
Okay, so there's a question about the negative consequences of ecosystem based adaptation. Um, so I, this may re be referring to the trade offs that I was talking about, um, and this is related to the fact that we have to um, acknowledge the fact that some of the interventions that we might be doing to say, for example, restore ecosystems. Um, that they might have those longer term uh, positive benefits in terms of adaptation benefits, but in the short term, it might require, for example, land acquisition. Um, and that might require moving people out. Um, and if that is not explicitly understood and acknowledged at the beginning, and there's not a plan to deal with it, um, if people are just forcibly resettled without any sort of uh, consultation process or compensation process, um, that's going to threaten the long-term uh, beneficial aspect of the of the EBA. So th my point is that um, we have to be explicit at the beginning that yes, EBA has a lot of positive characteristics. You know, it's it's designed to help people adapt in the long term. But if there are trade-offs, they need to be understood early on and built into consultative processes and compensation and safeguards processes. And these are gonna vary by the context. Um, but the important thing is, is to not treat EBA as always a win-win. So Leah, do you wanna add anything in to, to that? Yeah, well, I, I, I agree completely with what you said. And uh, for me, the, the best examples are uh, the project that I'm doing on ecosystem-based adaptation in coastal communities. Uh, and uh, in some cases, it's necessary to have to retreat. Um, and and that one thing that has to be very carefully done is how it will be brought up to people because there are a lot of uh, social psychological impact that can happen. And uh, we had this case in fact in one town in, uh, in Quebec uh, where they had to condemn houses and they did it under an emergency plan. And that, because it was done so fast, it really left a lot of uh, conflict and, uh, and stress and depression and different things in the community because of that. So we have to be very, very careful about this. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, that's exactly the same issue that um, here in New Jersey, uh, we're starting to talk about and in the, the um, New York area as well, managed retreat. Yeah. Uh, hugely controversial um, for mm -hmm. homeowners uh, in shore communities um, to start talking about the fact that some of these houses may be, need to be torn down and, and converted back to um, coastal dunes, um, salt marshes, and so forth. Um, so this is going to be a very long process. Um, it's going to have to involve some high-level negotiations, um, some extensive funding mechanisms, um, and so the um, state authorities and local authorities that are starting to do this um, luckily recognize that this is going to have to be a consultative process. And, and they're, they're talking about you know, projecting this in the future for 20 or 30 years. And so that's the scale of, of time we need to start thinking about um, for some of these processes. They're not sort of overnight um, solutions. Yeah, so. Um, so I had a request to paste some of the links to the articles that I referred to. So I've been doing that in the chat, um, if people uh, can see those in the chat. And I will also share the PowerPoint slide um, with um, Aurelia to potentially post somewhere, maybe on the SEM side or um, otherwise be able to distribute it for people who ask for it. So um, we can definitely do that. I've got um, all of those uh, references available um, for folks that want to um, uh, check those. So then we have another question from Mike. Local level capacity building is an essential component of effective devolution for nature-based solutions. Similarly, mainstream practice um, and conditions by the dictates of donors with short time frames tends to pay little more than lip service to participation. What and how might SIM contribute to the building of capacity to foster devolution of power to people engaging in NBS? That's a great question, Mike. Mm -hmm. Liette? Any yeah, thoughts? very good question. And I, this is where I think uh, we have to really start um, 
pushing for understanding the importance of participation, the social part of it that uh, often uh, these large projects are trying to avoid. Uh, and this means probably having gradually some position papers that are explaining for these uh, large uh, funding agencies that uh, you cannot do that on a two-year project, for example. It's usually a, a long process. Uh, and I've seen so many of them that, uh, yeah, people are going, just telling, oh, you can do that. This is the way you do it. And they go back. And by the end, these projects don't are not sustainable. Most of the time, people are going back to what uh, what has happened before. There was a very good one that uh, happened in Malawi, and you know, going three years later, uh, everything was back to what it was before the project. So this is something that, uh, if we were to do analysis of many of these uh, projects, I'm pretty sure that we would see that that people have not been continuing because they were not involved from the beginning. They were not consulted. They didn't have a necessary, necessary the, the, their needs failed. So that's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Mike's question points out the, the really essential role that STEM could play uh, in thinking, helping mm -hmm. organizations that are doing NBS. Um, think about how to do it effectively. Uh, and maybe it calls for us to do some sort of um, case study white paper on successful and unsuccessful uh, approaches to NBS around this question of participation, um, devolution, engagement, and so forth. Because I think Mike is exactly right. Um, knowing what we know about short-term donor projects, knowing what we know about um, these potential private sector projects that are really ramping up, there's a real danger of this lip service, as Mike says. And so I think SIM has a fantastic opportunity for us to showcase the knowledge of, of everyone who's on this call and, and elsewhere in SIM to do that sort of um, informed uh, practice that we could that we could help with. Um, and so maybe that's something can, that can be a benefit from this webinar is sort of take that forward and, and put something like that together. So um, thanks, Mike, for <laughs> uh, giving us ideas of what we can do um, post webinar. I think that would be great. Um, so we have a question about uh, how about asking citizens to participate in nature based solutions programs. We can appeal to them to grow plants in their own backyard, even two plants for each house um, add to green cover. Yeah, I think this is a great example of the fact that um, MBS have multiple scales, right? That they're from like the household scale, how can we improve integration of nature into our yards, um, into our um, uh, you know, sewer and water management in a neighborhood? Um, and then ex extend it out, you know, to maybe citywide and then um, further, you know, to bioregion and so forth. So there's going to be multiple scales and people's participation is going to vary depending on those scales. Uh, and I think the the uh, the importance of uh, information and information sharing and relying on um existing information networks to encourage nbs is going to be really important um so and a couple of the case studies that i mentioned in my presentation nbs were really built on existing mechanisms that had already built up trust in, and knowledge exchange um they might have come through one of the case studies in the pacific northwest had already started a, a, a process around sustainable land management even prior to thinking about nbs so there was a sort of built in mechanism for different groups, the farmers and the ranchers and um, uh, tribal officials and state government officials, they were already sort of meeting regularly. So there was already a mechanism. And so NBS sort of was built into that mechanism. So can we think about places where citizens are already um, getting information about, um, you know, how can they help in their household? I think in the U US, for example, um, we have um, something that's called 4-H, 
I don't know how, I, I think it's fairly international. I don't know yeah, how many countries it's in. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a youth organization that encourages, um, it originally grew out of a sort of farm-based um, approach a long time ago. Now it's, there's many more urban um, components to it, but it basically encourages um, youth to get involved in all sorts of youth activities, um, health and exercise and all sorts of stuff. That would be a great place to engage people in, in BS and that sort of pre-existing um, system that it also helps with information distribution. So, um, for example, 4-H, uh, there's a lot of health activities where kids pass on information to their parents about how to do healthier living and so forth. So I think there's all sorts of really interesting mechanisms that we could use to, to encourage um, knowledge sharing uh, around NBS as well. Okay, so... Um, there's a question about the Durban, South Africa example that uh, I used and how long this project took from initial partnerships to implementation of the NBS, um, understanding that, that monitoring and evaluation processes go much longer. Um, my understanding of the Durban uh, example is um, starting with the 2004 uh, citywide municipal planning process, it has been ongoing since then. So we're talking about 15 years or so. Uh, so it gives you a sense of how long these processes are um, and they can't be done overnight. And if you try to do an NBS as a quick fix, it's, it's unlikely. Um, so the Durban example did have a component that I didn't talk about, and that was land acquisition. Um, it wasn't forcible acquisition, but it was voluntary acquisition. So they basically um, put out uh, it, you know, information to various neighborhoods and communities and said, we're interested in expanding open space. Here's what we see as the co-benefits of that. They got buy-in, so a lots of different communities said, yeah, we think we could benefit from the expansion of open space. Um, then they were able to take those coalitions and approach private landowners about potentially um, buying private land space, um, rehabilitating some um, abandoned land space, like some brownfields space that didn't have a clear um, owner. So it was a sort of multifaceted process, but it took multiple years for that land acquisition part to expand open space uh, to be able to be part of it. It was not, it was not an easy fix. Um, so we have another question. To take SIM programs to people, we need to identify organizations, museums, schools, and colleges in each country. And through them, we need to make it a movement. We need to explain the gravity of the problem through videos and social media. Uh, so yeah, I think we just mentioned those sort of pre-existing organizations can be great. Um, Liette, do you wanna add uh, anything to that? Yeah, it's. I think the big challenge is always that uh, even if we put a lot of videos and social media about the the, the current situation, we're in dear con, con, dear situation right now, and people don't even look. Even for example, with the pandemic, people thought they would be probably more uh, thinking about nature and the protection of the environment. In fact, people were going more to nature but it's to get activities. It was not necessarily, there's a good paper that uh, analyzed that uh, through surveys that people were not thinking about the protection of the environment. It was just because they wanted to do exercise and all the gyms are closed. So we have to be very careful. It's a bit like, uh, it's funny, I was at the CBD uh, when the, um, uh, the IPES uh, report global assessment was published and uh, launched. And uh, so it was in the news, you know, the 1 million species to go to, ex to be extinct and all that. And it was clear for that, um, that morning that it, everybody was talking about it. A day later, people went back to what they were doing before, forgetting completely about the environment because they are, we're so disconnected now, especially in urban centers, that people don't even think about it. It's a bit like uh, when uh, my daughter was young and my husband went to help for the, the, the um, agricultural fair to bring the kids there. And one of the little girl uh, seeing the cow being milk ran out crying because it was the first time, five years old, almost six years old, first time that realized that the milk was coming from a cow and not from a bottle. So this is where we are now. 
So that's the big challenge. I'm, I'm teaching general ecology and I should say, we had some students of one to go outside. They are scared. So that's the reality. So it's very basic. We, we start, I should say, from, from zero pretty much right now on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the uh, in the chat box, um, uh, Angela has reminded us that uh, speaking of videos and, and so forth, um, all of the SIM dialogues, including this one, are available at the SIM YouTube channel. Yeah. So folks that do want to share this more widely in their networks are able to do so through that YouTube um, link. And that um, that's one way we can potentially get the word out uh, a little bit uh, more effectively, um, keep using our SIM networks and so forth. Um, so there's another um, related thing that SIM should make an accept, uh, effective network to take NBS programs to the doorstep of citizens. Um, I think we just spoke about what are the different mechanisms to do that? What are the different um, uh, possibilities. And I would like to mention also in the chat, um, one of our participants today was from the International Federation of Landscape Architects. Um, and that's a fantastic uh, place where we could have real opportunities to um, join up and think about NBS um, through uh, various NBS approaches that are built into landscape architecture um, programs and priorities and training and so forth. Um, here at Rutgers, where I am, we have a, a very well-known uh, and effective landscape architecture program um, that trains students both at the undergraduate and master's level. Um, and they do have classes on NBS and eco -based, uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. They build that into their training. And those are the sorts of partnerships that I think um, make a lot of sense that we could um, uh, extend the reach uh, even more widely beyond, beyond SIM. So next question, we are working on home gardens um, as NBS for climate resilience, livelihood security, et cetera. Um, as we were talking about, we should use ecosystem services valuation approaches cautiously um, like the invest model. Uh, which model or approach would be best to examine ecosystem services trade-offs and why? Um, so my point here was not that you shouldn't use these models, but that you should, as the, the questioner says, use them cautiously and understand their limitations. Um, the INVEST model in particular does acknowledge trade-offs between ecosystem services. Um, granted, it doesn't model all ecosystem services. It's fairly limited. It's um, uh, you know, a smaller section of you know, water and, and, um, and soil and a couple of others. Um, so the trade-offs between ecosystem services are embedded in some of these models. Um, but what I was saying is that trade-offs among stakeholders, for example, or trade-offs among um, uh, benefits, um, particularly around financial benefits, are not well um, embedded in some of these models. And so these are going to require a different process. Um, this may involve a little bit of extra work on, on the part of um, civil society organizations or research organizations um, to try to identify where those benefit trade-offs might potentially be. Um, and I, my point is to encourage people to sort of move beyond traditional cost-benefit analysis because that doesn't give us a sense of the unevenness of both the costs and the benefits. Um, and so some ways to, there's, there's lots of sort of innovative mechanisms that people have been using. Um, I'll just mention one, and that is deliberative valuation. This is a fairly new approach. Um, it can be time consuming. Uh, I will, you know, we can't, can't sugarcoat it. It can cost more money and it can be time consuming to do it. But what it basically involves is getting stakeholders themselves um, in a process to think about valuation beyond monetary valuation. And so this often involves um, ranking of different potential co-benefits. Um, they're sort of compared to one another in an iterative process um, where different groups will say, you know, I think benefits A, B, and C are most important. I would trade them off against C, D, and E. Um, and try to come to some sort of consensus without using formal uh, monetary costs um, to reach a consensus that maybe benefits um, A and B are going to be the ones we're going to prioritize in our in our NBS. So there's there's an expanding literature on deliberative valuation. I would encourage people to to take a look at that um, and see if it fits with the, the particular model um, uh, of NBS that that people are implementing. 
Um, and but this is a great example of where um, there can be a real conjoining of scientific knowledge plus local, um, perhaps indigenous knowledge where that's appropriate. So research organizations could bring um, their expertise in doing deliberative valuation. Um, and that could be used alongside a process um, that incorporates indigenous and local knowledge through perhaps um, working with elders, um, thinking about uh, you know, how Liet's case study of, of involving youth, for example, in biosphere uh, management is a great example because there's so much um, cultural transmission that can happen um, through NBS programs and ensuring that's considered a benefit um, and that's included in, in these, these assessments of, you know, what, what sort of benefits are going to go to whom. Um, so I, I would just encourage people to have open minds about um, not relying too much on any one tool um, and think about uh, ways to be inclusive uh, across stakeholders and across benefit categories. Liette, anything you want to add to that? No, especially I realize the time. So <laughs> yeah, we're really running out of time. And I think we're, we've got a couple more questions. So um, as the uptake of NBS increases, how do we ensure the guidelines are being used? Um, worries about things not being done correctly. I mean, I think that's the whole point of the global standard. And we're in a process now to sort of determine how that is going to be monitored and used over time. Um, Liad, anything you want to add to that? Well, just to say that, yeah, it's a, it's a question where we have quite a lot of discussion <laughs> recently on that. And I think uh, this is something that we'll have to be very, very careful. And uh, it has to be done in a way that we we know that all the aid criteria are met, not just the lip service of a few versus others, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, next question is, um, what would the trade-offs in using technological advancements, e.g. use of remotely sensed data for advisories and acceptance of NBS for sustainable development of local communities? Has this been studied? Um, I, I would say this falls in the category of um, being aware of what your tools can do and what they can't do. Obviously, remotely sensed data is going to be really important for um, understanding some of your ecological, um, uh, the, the sort of spatial planning questions, um, where ecosystem services um, uh, might need to trade off against each other. But it, that remotely sensed data is not going to tell you anything about um, stakeholder priorities, for example. Um, and so you could use it as a tool in a deliberative forum. Um, you might be able to show those maps and have people write on the maps, where are their priorities for cultural ecosystem services? And there's actually some really great um, examples of that in the literature. Um, if you do a search, for example, for public um, GIS, public participatory GIS, um, PPI, uh, PPGIS, GIS, um, great examples of people using that for, for cultural ecosystem services. So it's a, it's a way of combining um, approaches, but not just relying on, on the, the data itself. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say that, especially when you talk to communities, try to first understand what is the level of, of uh, literacy and capacity. Um, there are some communities that... Uh, as so, and some people, as soon as you bring too much technology, they will shut down. So you have to be very careful about that because at that point they will not be able to understand. If you put a, a, a remote sensing map, uh, and they may probably completely lost it. So yeah, no, that's the, something that you have to be careful. Yeah. Um, so there's a question from Emmanuel about um, great suggestion about making some of the data transparent and open to stakeholders. Um, based on your experiences, is this something that is feasible um, or would you avoid from people um, to using the standard? So thinking about data management and accessibility for the NBS standard specifically, which is currently requested as part of the self-assessment. Um, yeah, I think I think this is going to be another great place where SEM could take a lead in thinking about what would be some platforms um, for data availability, um, maybe build it into some, whatever the repository of information about the NBS standard ends up being. Uh, I think data accessibility should be a potential priority here. Um, not being a 
IT person, I don't have great ideas about that, that what it would look like in terms of a platform. Um, but I do think that SIM would have a great opportunity to um, engage with the various, particularly the more research oriented members of our network um, to provide um, that sort of uh, data collection and analysis for people, civil society organizations who are doing NBS who might not have that capacity themselves. So SIM could be like that bridge between um, the, the folks who could manage some of the data, collect some of the data, and then folks who would actually use the data. Um, and that might be, might be some place where we could really position ourselves um, effectively. Leah, anything to add? Uh, not too much in terms of it's important for transparency and also uh, as soon as you keep some data for, out from people, uh, it can probably uh, lead to conflict. The other thing is we have to remember we now have the UNESCO recommendation on uh, science and scientists and very soon because we received this week the, uh, the final draft, we'll have also a recommendation which we hope will be accepted approved by the countries uh, at the end of the year. Um, but we have also the recommendation on open science. So that means that it will be pushed on a lot of organization now to be all open around the data. They have to become available. So that's something that uh, even the uh, private sector will have to probably start to think about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, cognizant of the time, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I think we did, uh, uh, there's a question about the, the role of landscape architects. Um, and thank you so much for, for joining the webinar. I think this is a great um, place where we could intersect more closely. Um, and I hope we can follow up on that um, and have better connections between um, SIM and, and the, the uh, Federation of Landscape Architects. So thank you so much. Um, so there's two last questions. So one is about obtaining FPIC, and then one is about thinking about NBS uh, as a mechanism for transformational change, um, which are both great questions, but both very broad. <laughs> um, I think we're going to have a challenge of addressing them in the last two minutes. Um, so maybe we can just say that um, um, FPIC for sure, there's a lot of good um, analysis already on where it's done well and where it's not done well. And that, again, might be a place where, um, as part of some SIM case studies, we might feature um, FPEC as a particular tool that we can highlight um, how to do it um, uh, effectively. Um, and in terms of transformational change, I will just um, use this as an opportunity to highlight that um, in SIM, we did do a paper um, on transformational con uh, conservation, a white paper um, that's out and available um, through SIM, through our website. Um, and we specifically talk about NBS as being a mechanism for, for moving towards transformational change. So that's a great uh, resource to look at. Um, I don't think we're going to solve it here in our last minute, but uh, hopefully that paper uh, will, will spark some thinking. Um, so Angela, can I turn it back over to you to... to wrap us up and and uh, I don't know if there's any announcement that needs to be made about the next dialogues or not. Thank you, Pam. And uh, thank you all for this great event and the participation of all the members and the great questions. I think it's, it's extremely important uh, to continue with this process. It's part of the learning by doing process that we have also under the standard of nature-based solutions. So all the comments will be incorporated in, in our internal discussion. And that's the purpose of these dialogues. So thank you very much to you and to Liet for this great event. And uh, we, are, uh, we will be informing you very soon about our next uh, dialogue that will be on ecosystem governance uh, under the leadership of Liet. And we will continue with our uh, regular events um, and we will be informing in, uh, on the website and through emails the, the following events. So thank you very much again for, for this great session. Great. Thanks for everyone for uh, attendance. It's great yeah. questions. Thank you very much.